If you think of great wealth when you're imagining pirates, then you're probably thinking of someone like the man we're going to talk about in this video. A man who was not willing to go down in history as an average Joe, who when asked about it had this to say. In an honest service there is thin commons, low wages and hard labor. In this, plenty and satiety, pleasure and ease, liberty and power. No, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. Nicknamed as Black Bart long after his death, this pirate roamed the Caribbean and West Africa for almost three years making it a significantly long career during which he is said to have captured more than 400 ships. This is the story we'll go over today. This is the story of Bartholomew Roberts. <laughs> Bartholomew Roberts was born in 1682 in Pembrokeshire, Wales. Though his first name was John, he changed it to Bartholomew for unknown reasons later on his piratical career, which could have been just an alias. According to Richard Sanders in his book If I Pirate I Must Be, the 1670 hearth tax assessment for Little Newcastle speaks of a George Robert who was either Bartholomew Robert's father or grandfather. It also says that his family had one hearth and definitely not a pauper. A will by William Robert, certainly a relative and quite possibly Bartholomew's brother, written in Welsh in 1744, shows he had cash and cattle to dispose of, at least 45 pounds, eight oxen, as well as a horse and saddle. It looks like Robert's family was middle class and definitely not poor. It's unlikely that Roberts dedicated too long a career on merchant ships, because for most of his life, England had been at war with France and Spain, which would have made it much easier to serve in the Royal Navy or even work for privateers. We don't know much about the man up until 1718, when he was serving as mate on a sloop on Barbados. Flash forward to 1719, according to Captain Charles Johnson, Roberts was serving as a second mate on the slave ship Princess, which was commanded by Captain Abraham Plum. It was while serving on this ship that he got into contact with pirates up close. In late May 1719, the Princess was anchored off the coast of Anomabu in West Africa, when it was captured by the pirate Howell Davis, who was at the time commanding two vessels, the Royal Rover and the Royal James. It is possible that Roberts already knew Davis, for although being reluctant of joining the pirate crew at first, he ended up doing so after seeing the advantages for profit. Allegedly, Davis noticed that Roberts was skilled in navigation, so the pirate consulted with him often. Also, because they were both Welsh, Davis could speak with Roberts in their own language and keep information hidden from the rest of the queue should it be necessary. Homer, watch your mouth! Oh, I gotta go, my damn wiener kids are listening. The rise of Roberts would come a couple of weeks later, when the pirates arrived at the island of Principe in the Gulf of Guinea. While disguised as an English ship, they invited the governor aboard to eat, although the real intention of the pirates was to capture him and hold him for ransom. Unbeknownst to the pirate, but known to the governor, the ruse had been discovered and soldiers attacked the pirates, killing Captain Davis himself. <coughs> After leaving the island, the pirates had to elect a new captain. Captain Johnson states that Roberts was accordingly elected, although he had not been above six weeks among them. Johnson also claims that he accepted of the honor, saying that since he had dipped his hands in muddy water and must be a pirate, it was better being a commander than a common man. It was then that Robert's pirate career left port. While cruising in West African waters, the pirates captured four ships. One of them, an English slave ship, was carrying around 50 pounds or 23 kilograms of gold dust. Afterwards, Roberts decided it was time to leave Africa and the crew decided to head west. 
After a month-long trip, they arrived at the Brazilian coast, where they spent two months without capturing a single ship. Oh! The first big catch was due to arrive on late November when they cruised onto Bahia, now Salvador. When the pirates arrived at the harbor, they noticed it was filled with ships. They recognized it as the Portuguese treasure fleet, the Lisbon fleet. They disguised the royal rover as a merchant ship and under the cover of darkness, they managed to capture one of the ships stealthily. When asked which was the richest ship, the Portuguese captain pointed towards the Sagrada Familia. They managed to capture the ship after a swift battle and managed to escape the harbor with it. The pirates now had a fleet of two ships. According to Angus Constam, in his book The Pirate World, the Sagrada Familia was carrying the Portuguese treasure equivalent to 240,000 pieces of eight, as well as a diamond-studded crucifix that was destined to the Portuguese king. In short, it was a fortune. They then set off to the Ile du Diable, off of what is now the French Guiana, to divide the plunder. They captured a brig which Roberts renamed as Fortune and added it to their pirate fleet. It was then that one of the worst examples of betrayal in pirate history happened. They came about a ship somewhere along the coast of Brazil, which Roberts pursued upriver with the Fortune, leaving Robert Kennedy, one of his lieutenants, in command of the Royal Rover. The ship escaped the Fortune, but by the time Roberts returned to the rendezvous point, he found out his other ship was nowhere to be seen. Kennedy had escaped with the Royal Rover and taken the Portuguese plunder with him. Roberts and his remaining men were furious, as you could imagine, but also powerless. You never know who you can trust until they betray you. The saying goes that all clouds have a silver lining, and it, and it was no different for Roberts, who resumed his career after taking such a massive hit with the fortune a 10 guns loop and just 40 men under his command. Kennedy's betrayal, however, would be the motivating factor for sketching up a set of articles to govern life aboard the ship, which would then be known as the Pirate Code. This meant a formal intention to bind everyone under the same conditions and enforce discipline. From January 1720 on, Roberts would capture a number of ships on the outskirts of the Caribbean, a sloop of Tobago, the Philippa, and then two more sloops and a brig of Barbados attracted the attention of pirate hunters. One such ship, coincidentally, the Philippa, who had been rearmed and seeking revenge, and the Somerset, allegedly carrying 120 men, far more than Robert's 40 men. Both ships had been set off from Barbados and meant a real danger should they meet. However, at the time, Roberts met with the pirate Montigny de Balise in his loop Sea King at Barbados. Both captains agreed to join their forces. And avoidably, the day came when the two fleets met. The pirates sighted two sails and decided to pursue, only to find out at the last minute that they were pirate hunters. According to Captain Johnson, Montigny de Palis fled immediately, while the Fortune and the Somerset exchanged broadsides. Although Roberts decided to ultimately flee as the Somerset was far too powerful for the pirates which they accomplished by throwing over their guns and other heavy goods and thereby lightening the vessel. It's better to flee and fight another day than stand your ground needlessly. How do you even stand your ground at sea anyways? After this encounter, the pirates went to Dominica to careen and repair the fortune. It was here that they found 13 sailors that had been marooned by a French ship and they all agreed to join the pirates. For the next couple of weeks, Roberts and his crew spent running away from French patrols that had been sent out by the governor of Martinique, who had learned they were in the area. This meant another milestone in Roberts' career, who decided to change his Jolly Roger in accordance. Up until that moment, his flag showed himself holding an hourglass with a skeleton representing death. However, because he had been troubled so much by both Barbados and Martinique, he decided to make them part of his flag and he did so by showing himself standing over two skulls labeled ABH and AMH, namely 
a barbarian head and a Martinican head, representing the heads of the respective governors to whom he swore revenge. Afterwards, the pirates headed north to Newfoundland to attack the fishing and whaling fleets, which they expected to be very rich with plunder as the fish and whaling industry at the time were very lucrative. They arrived in late June 1720 to the fishing station of Trepezy, and the pirates sailed into the harbor, with their black colors flying, drums beating and trumpets sounding. There was a single armed ship named Biddeford, but her crew fled ashore scared, leaving the whole harbor defenseless. According to Captain Johnson, it is impossible particularly to recount the destruction and havoc they made here, burning and sinking all the shipping except a Bristol galley and destroying the fisheries and landing stages of the poor planters, without remorse or compunction. Reportedly that day, 22 ships were captured as well as 250 small fishing boats. The pirates are abandoned their old sloop and the 16-gun Bristol galley they spared ended up becoming Robert's new flagship, which he then used to scour the Newfoundland waters, capturing 10 more ships. One of those captured ships was a 26-gun merchantman, which Robert took for himself again, leaving the Bristol galley for his crew. The new ship was promptly renamed as the Good Fortune. Then they met again with the pirate Montigny de Palis, who promptly apologized for fleeing in their previous encounter with the pirate hunters. Given the fact that Robert had already suffered a harsh betrayal by his former Lieutenant Kennedy, it's interesting that he was still willing to sail with such a captain that had already left him alone to his luck. In any case, they sailed together and seized a couple of prizes, but Roberts knew that it was just a matter of time until someone would send warships to hunt him down, which is why he decided to sail south again. Roberts' whole Newfoundland raids ended up with the capture of over 40 ships and hundreds of small vessels. Plenty of action if you ask me. Leave anything for us? Just bodies. Around late August they were off South Carolina, and by September both Roberts and the Palisse were back in the West Indies, where they went to Cariacou, between St. Vincent and Grenada, to conduct repairs to their ships. Later in October, with provisions running short, the pirates sailed the good fortune into the harbor of Basse-Terre on St. Christopher, where, according to Captain Johnson, being denied all succor or assistance from the government, they fired in revenge on the town and burned two ships in the road. The pirates retreated to the island of St. Barthelemy. Only this time, the governor was willing to assist them, so there were no shots fired. Wise choice. At this time, Roberts renamed his ship to Royal Fortune and the police adopted Good Fortune for his own sloop. When they left St. Barthelemy, they captured a 22-gun brig of Tortola, which Roberts took for him as the new Royal Fortune. By late October, they were off St. Lucia, where they captured a brig and a sloop, then turning to Dominica, where they encountered a well-armed Dutch merchantman with 42 guns. The pirates fought the Dutch ship, only this time the Palice did not flee and instead joined the fight. Eventually, the pirates reigned supreme and the merchantman became the new royal fortune. The 15 small ships in the harbor promptly surrendered to the pirates. By this time, Roberts had decided to sail again back to West Africa, since he estimated that by then there was a real chance of pirate hunters looking for them, so trying their luck elsewhere would be safer. In early November, the pirates sailed to Bermuda to pick up on the trade winds to make the trip to Africa. By early December, they arrived at the Cape Verde Islands, where they encountered a Portuguese convoy. Although Roberts chased them, not only did they escape, but the winds then impeded the trip to Africa, so they had no choice than to sail back to the West Indies, where they captured a couple more ships on the way to Samana Bay in Hispaniola for repairs. At the time, Roberts was having difficulty keeping his crew's morale up due to lack of prices, which led Roberts to execute a group of deserters while on Hispaniola. On February 18, 1721, the Royal Fortune and the Good Fortune arrived at St. Lucia, where they captured a merchantman which they later used as a decoy, pretending to be a slaver ship. This led to several ships being captured 
which helped boost the crew's morale. Until late March, they scoured the West Indies. The police decided to leave the company and go his own way, which led Roberts to take another attempt at sailing to Africa. Unfortunately, in April, Roberts had yet another disappointment. The good fortune left Roberts because her captain, Thomas Ansis, decided to make his own way. Roberts was left with just his ship, the Royal Fortune, and about 228 men. Roberts made it to Cape Verde in late May to replenish supplies, and finally reached the African coast at the mouth of the Senegal River, where he captured two French sloops of 10 and 16 guns and over 130 men, who promptly surrendered after seeing the black flag. The two ships were added to the pirate fleets, with Roberts renaming one of them as the Ranger to become a scout ship, saving the other one for storage. At the end of June, they arrived at Sierra Leone, where they spent six weeks trading and repairing the ships. Here they found men who were fond of the pirates, and indulged them in many pleasures, as Captain Johnson adds. The men were faithful, and the women so obedient that they are very ready to prostitute themselves to whomsoever their masters shall command them. By early August, the crew, weary of whoring and drinking, set sail again to business. Further south along the coast, they came upon the Sestos River to find a frigate named the Onslow from the Royal African Company, commanded by Captain Guy while resupplying. Because most of her crew were on shore, the pirates captured the ship easily. Roberts kept the frigate for himself, but gave his ship to Captain Guy, a gesture which you probably wouldn't expect from a merciless band of robbers and murderers. The Onslow then became the fourth and last Royal Fortune. The trip continued along the African coast, reaching Nigeria in October, where they captured three slave ships, but had to leave quickly after cleaning the ships since the locals, according to Captain Johnson, did not prove so civil as they expected, for they refused to have any commerce or trade with them when they understood they were pirates, an indication that these poor creatures, in the narrow circumstances they were in, and without the light of the gospel or the advantage of an education, have, notwithstanding, such a moral innate honesty as would abraid and shame the most knowing Christian. The pirates left to Cape Lopez to fill the water supplies and to Annabon for provisions, after which they headed to Cape Apollonia, west of Cape Three Points in today's Ghana, where they captured two more slave ships. Afterwards, they headed to Ouida, which is now Ouida, arriving on January 11th, 1722. This would be their final expedition. There they captured a great prize of 11 slave ships that surrendered at the mere sight of the pirate ships. One of these ships, holding 32 guns, was added to the fleet by the name Great Ranger, while the existing Ranger was renamed to Little Ranger to avoid confusion. While in port, the pirates managed to intercept a letter from General Phipps to Mr. Baldwin, the Royal African Company's agent at Ouida, stating that Roberts had been sighted to windward of Cape Three Points, giving him warning to take measures before the arrival of the Swallow Mine of War, which was pursuing the pirates. Johnson states that Robert said, such brave fellows cannot be supposed to be frightened at this news. While still anchored at Ouida, a ship was spotted to which Roberts ordered the Great Ranger to pursuit. The pirates had no way of knowing that the ship was the HMS Swallow of 50 guns, commanded by Captain Chaloner Ogle. The Swallow fated an evasive maneuver until they were past the horizon, where they would be hidden from Roberts on port. As Admiral Akbar said, It's a trap! The Swallow fired a broadside and the fight started, in which finally the Great Ranger was forced to surrender. Then, on February 10th, the Swallow returned to Ouida, and this time Roberts sailed out to meet with it in battle. Roberts famously put on his finest clothes and ordered the Jolly Roger hoisted. On the battle that followed, the Swallow proceeded to fire at will. Roberts was killed on the first broadside, which was a powerful blow to the crew's morale that made many of them desert. The remaining pirates were forced to surrender. The great pirate Bartholomew Roberts was dead. The remaining pirates were tried starting on May 28, 1722, 
and finally on April 20th, 52 of them were sentenced to death by hanging. 37 were given long sentences of labor on the Cape Coast mines or jail in London. 77 African pilots were sold to slave traders and 79 were ultimately acquitted after proving they had been forced to serve under Roberts. The remainder are said to have died of the wounds or disease in prison. Some historians claim this mass hanging to be the official end of the golden age of piracy. We've reached the end of the story of the most successful pirates. There are more details in Captain Johnson's book talking about both his act of cruelty and kindness if you are interested in the intricacies of his life. But I want to highlight a couple of key points about Roberts. He turned to piracy because he yearned for both wealth and adventure. His experience in navigation and cunning certainly helped him have a relatively long career. It's difficult to tell whether he was the richest pirate, but judging from the amount of ships captured, distance traveled, and the length of his career, we can say that he was certainly the most successful. Captain Johnson states in his book that Roberts supposedly managed to capture the governor of Martinique during his raids in the West Indies and have him hang from the yardarm of his ship. This arises from a supposed letter to London from Governor Bennett of Bermuda. According to Angus Constam and David Rickman, this is most certainly an embellishment. It would be pretty poetic after all to finally have his revenge. He clearly never expected to get out alive from his ordeal. Remember, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. Is it okay to live and die under your own terms? Whichever those may be, you be the judge. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video and stay tuned for more as we dive deeper into the depths of the history and romance of real life pirates.